how the hell do you land big clients like Tony Robbins, Russell Brunson, Cardone Ventures? How do you do that? The end game was to become the best in the info world, and we did it. The drawback of being in the industry that we're in is everything looks better than it actually is. Right now, we're on a very aggressive path of rolling up companies. We're actually looking at rolling up one of our biggest competitors. We're going to try and buy someone bigger than us by the end of this year. So my original dream as a kid, I always wanted to travel, and the dream for me was to be a pilot. The work-life balance cliche, in my personal opinion, actually doesn't exist. The following is a conversation with Rohan Sheth, founder of GrowRev. He's been in the online marketing space for over 10 years. He's managed over 50 million in uh, ad spend, and he's generated over $100 million in revenue for his clients. He's been featured in Forbes, Huffington Post, Entrepreneur with GrowRev, and uh, I got him on the podcast. He's also the guy who's helped me tremendously on my own Instagram journey. We're about to hit 200,000 followers thanks to a quick conversation that I had with him about two years ago years ago. So I got him on the podcast and I asked him a lot about how his brain works, how his business works, and you're going to profit from this now. So let's crack right into it. All right, Rohan, thanks for your time. Um, how the hell do you land big clients like Tony Robbins, Russell Brunson, Cardone Ventures? How do you do that? How do I got them as a client? Man, that's a crazy story. So I came before those clients became clients of mine. Um, and this is like, pre-COVID, we're going back a little bit. So like 2018, 2017-ish. Um, the agency that I started was very focused on the event route. Um, we only focused on events. We did all the big, big free-to-fee events all over Asia, all over Europe, all over Canada, yeah. the United States. Um, we were filling massive rooms for some of the big TV personalities, you know, and then, you know, COVID happens and events go to zero. And I was like, well, there goes my entire business. Mm-hmm. Um but I was like, okay, well, if we work in the event space, what well, we've kind of dabbled in the online webinar world and just kind of you know, tested it out. But there's so many people already playing there. We're like, let them play in their own little world. We have our own blue ocean that we're fishing in. That it kind of disappeared. So I'm like, all right, well, who do I know? And then um, came to be that I knew the guys at the D- Dean Graziosi team. They needed some help with some Facebook related stuff, help them out. And I said, if I can help you out with kind of, you know, some of the issues that you're running into, I want a shot at running your traffic um and they're like okay and i'm like how about this i'll help you give me a shot running your traffic for 60 days we won't charge you if we beat your internal team we want the entire ad account <laughs> and um we did and then eventually we ended up getting them as a client and then one thing led to another it was just like referral after referral after referral that just kind of started from that whole process so long drawn out story and that's yeah. kind of how it came to be damn i mean look how I would love for you to be super honest there. How much of that move of like, hey, let us do it for 60 days, how much of that was confidence versus how much of that was kind of like Hail Mary? Most confidence is majority of the time. We're negotiating a very big deal right now, and I mean big deal. Um, that will pretty much transition the entire trajectory of our company. And we're doing it with the exact same way and going in and saying, Hey, let us go run your ad account um, for free. And if we beat the, if we beat your current buyers, we want the entire budget. And this budget is north of $50 million a year in advertising one client. (laughs) <laughs> let's go i mean that's such a cool thing in, in b2b i mean i see it in b2c as well a lot but especially in b2b this whole idea of like just work yourself up deliver awesome results to like a client and then get referred get referred get referred and it's just like all about like how well do you deliver and then yeah. uh these people just refer you with that um you know what's funny so one thing that i did in, in preparation to our quick conversation here is i checked out your twitter and you're not really active on there anymore. No, but, that's a one pl- that's a one platform that I'm not active at all on. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so funny that you mentioned Cardone Capital because you like I'm I'm sharing my screen right now, like Rohan Sheth 2013. So that's like eleven years ago. You were yeah. like super like, hey, Greg Cardone, like my new mouse pad and all that stuff. It's so funny. Like you're quoting the 10x rule and all that jazz. And um, I mean that must be really freaking mindfuck for you to be like, I was the guy who read the books and kind of tweeted at Cardone. And then you were the guy who worked with people like Cardone Capital and, and, and Cardone Cardo Ventures. Like yeah. Uh, Cardo Ventures, yeah, yeah. Cardo Ventures. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a bit of a mindfuck to be honest, even like looking at like, you know, when I was dead, like thinking about even working with Tony Robbins and Dean Graziosi, like those two, and like having the testimonial from Dean as well, that we've been given that's on our website um you know i remember being even before that twitter feed like dead broke 2009 2010 and just listening like i 
downloaded Tony Robbins and stuff or some friend of mine gave it to me and I would just li- be driving around and just religiously listening to it, right? Just kind of mm-hmm. getting it uh, into my head. And then to today, be like, you know, 10 years later, be like, yeah, I'm, I'm, we manage their advertising. Like That was a pretty big, pretty big mind fuck going into it for a bit. I remember going into even Dean Garziosi and watching Dean pitch on infomercials on on, on TV, like late night, and I just had nothing <laughs> to do. I'm like, this guy's got a fucking this is a sales machine. And then to be sitting in his office 10 years later and you know, being referred business by him is a different world. Ah, it's fucking crazy. I mean, it was similar, but on, on albeit a smaller scale for me with RSD back then, like, you know, Real Social Dynamics, I was just a yeah. fanboy from the block, from this small little Austrian village, and I was just watching all the videos. And then I remember this one day I flew from, from Vegas to, to uh, Santa Monica sitting next to Tyler. And I'm like, I, this is the guy I used to watch the videos. Like, holy shit. That's and now so I'm crazy. With him. Yeah. Like, it was so amazing. It's such a mind fuck. Now, when you look at, you know, your journey of, of working with the biggest people in this in the industry, is that something that you aimed for in the beginning of your journey? Or was it more something yeah. like, hey, I did this. Might as well aim for the next bigger thing. And you kind of worked yourself up. Um, Not necessarily aim for it. I did have the, the end goal was obviously... You know, Info was a division that I understood really well, just coming from the affiliate world. That's where I came and spent a decent amount of my early days in the internet marketing world. Um, so I was like, all right, well, let's just go see what we can do in the info space. And it just happened to be, you know, one of the things that we talk about with one of my other companies is having a clear end game. And the end game was to become the best in the info world. And we did it, right? Um, and, you know, now we're transitioning in a very di- different direction and we've got the exact same clear end game now um but even today you know some of the opportunities that we get in that world is it's interesting because i would have never thought i'd be in that in that space but grateful for having those opportunities now come to me yeah i mean when you say you never thought it you you never thought you could ever be there now you are there do you now have thoughts where you're also like well i can never make it but hold on a second that's what i thought earlier so fuck it let's go for that yeah all the time dude and the bigger you get, the di- the bigger you get, the different challenges that come into play, right? So it's just like also, is that you know when you're small in a one man show, you're like fuck, I can only if I don't wish I can only get to like a hundred grand a month in business income, and then you're like, huh, I did it. I wish I could get to a million, huh, I did it. But then like the problems get bigger, the fucking challenges get bigger. Now you're dealing with different mental be- mental games with yourself. Um, so it's just it's it's a different ball game across the board, and just uh, understand, like I said, you know. Making sure that you have a clear end game, like that's all it is. What do you want? What do you want? We know where we want the end game for the agency to go to. Obviously, not with a couple of our other companies, but the agency will have a very clear end game in the next 24 to 36 months. We know the number we need to get to. It yeah. doesn't matter if we go get the biggest guys or if we go get, you know, 10 half decent, um, half decent guys. That goal that you mentioned, is that the the $100 million net worth or is that connected to your personal $100 million net worth that you yeah. want to reach in 36 yeah. months? Uh, by, yeah, so by, by, by the age of 40, the goal is to get to 100. Uh, and then the bigger goal is to get to be have a decent exit um, within the next 36 months. Damn. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I wanted to ask you too is I have kind of like two camps of friends of mine. One camp is like you don't ever aim to get an exit. Because especially when you build a personal brand and the other people are like, the exit is the only thing you do it for. What yeah. what, what is it for you? Because I feel like it's somehow still connected to you as a personal brand. How can you exit out of that if you have a personal brand that is connected to your face? Um, well, if you look at my personal brand now compared to what it was before, my personal brand today is just more of like a dancing bear situation. It's like I don't even produce as much content as you think. Uh, we just have a very, very dialed team that does it for me. Um, even the personal brand that's going to get restarted probably in the middle of this year at some point, we're restructuring, we're coming in, funny enough, with a new company that we're launching with a partner of mine called Scale to Sale. Um, and that entire methodology is going to be about scaling and exiting companies, which is everything that we've done internally here. And then Nick, who's my partner in our company, his entire background of doing over $6 billion in exits. Sheesh. Um, Yeah. So he said he's a massive, massive, he comes from private equity, he works for private equity, so he's done a lot there. Now, the reason for us to even talk about exiting across the board is, you know, the way I look at anything is everything's for sale, right? Everything at some point is for sale. Now, some of the, if you think about it, the amount of companies that last, you know, on for decades and decades and decades gets dwindled and dwindled down to a point where, you know, there comes to a point where it's like, you really are not, unless you're turning this into building, if I turn 
you never know. I could, you know, two years from now, we could turn into something massive and I turn me grow rib into this entire media property that just becomes bigger and bigger. But we've already had offers. We already have offers. So there's clearly attention there. We'd be stupid not to take it, have a capital event. Um, and then from that point on, you know, one, I'm not as stressed out all the time and being like, okay, what am I doing next? What am I doing next? At least now family's taking care of legacy, taking care of, and then I can go build a real fun legacy company after that. Hmm. It's, it's funny that you mentioned this whole idea is like uh, with every decade, there's less and less companies that go through that. And this, this concept of longevity and legacy has been on my mind very much so as well now the last year, because now I've had my current consulting business since 2019. And just in that time span, now the last five years, like we've been close to ex extinction, like multiple times, we've had to overcome like so much shit, like offer yeah. changes, market changes, black swan events, staff leaving and so on and so forth. And I'm like, there, there's been so, just in these five years, there's been so many points in, in my time where I could have just let it go and just built something else, some hype AI bullshit, whatever, anything that sells easily. But I always kind of chose the hard path and say, no, I'd rather continue this and keep growing mm -hmm. with that instead of just going down easy. Um, but at the same time, I'm not sure if that's even the right thing to do. Uh, I would love to hear kind of your thoughts on that. Oh, bro, I can write a fucking book on that whole last five years of just getting your ass handed to you. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <clears throat> but it, the way I look at it is it's a train of thought, right? The one thing, and the, the drawback of being in the industry that we're in is everything looks better than it actually is. Mm. Um, you know, what I mean by that is like, if there's a reason to why people are bouncing from offer to offer, you know, um, business to business is because they can't build one thing that's going to have long-term sustainability. One of the things that we talk about, and I've talked about this across the board, is you know being in the position that we were in for a very long time, where it's like we had behind the scenes of some of the biggest offers, right? When you're running traffic, now we we come in, we get access to traffic, and then we start look, and then we start getting access to sales, and you start getting conversations about about operations and things going to play, and you're like, these guys aren't doing as good as they actually think they're doing, like, and then you started having those real conversations. But then even, you know, I just spoke last week in Tampa at an event and I said, you know, most of you guys, and it's all info, it was all info marketers. And I said, most of you guys are within 12 to 24 months away from being essentially extinct. And the reason being is you build offers, you don't build businesses. Now, if you can reverse engineer a build, how to turn an offer into an actual business, you can turn that into a brand that can turn into an exitable outcome. And I broke down that entire place on, you know, how info brands themselves can turn into uh, into an outcome where you can have an exit but how you do it is is understanding the the three ways of the, the three the three parts that needs to be implemented in those and when you look at that across the board you know me and you chose a hard path to us right now it looks hard because we're feeding in this world of you know just fake marketers and a bunch of bullshit artists that are out there because, you know, all do exactly what they're doing for half the price and then they fuck the bed and don't get the results. And then they come back to you and now they're crying. But at the end of the day, if we just stay, the, if we just stay the path at some point, these guys are going to realize these guys are here to stay. They're serious. And no matter what actually happens, you know, you can't beat longevity in anything at the end of the day. Consistency and longevity is going to beat long term. So just keep going through the hard shit. Like, like I said, I, I could write a book on get my ass handed to me over the last five years because I've had everything come at me at one time and still here. I mean, first of all, thanks for saying that. That really confirms my thoughts over the last couple of months of this, like, stop jumping from easy to easy offer because that also kind of, like, creates this false idea about business that, oh, it's supposed to be easy and it's supposed to sell itself. But once you really learn how to sell something that might not sell itself, that might be, you know, something that needs that needs explaining and so on and so forth. And you just sell it by sheer will, proper marketing, proper funnels, and proper sales. Then you then you got the skill set to just repeat it over and over again. Cause I was the guy who 100%. sold the easy thingy, the easy hype thingy. Well, I was just there at the right time at the right spot. But now I'm the guy who kind of sells a thing that is not just built on hype, that is not just like sexy right now, and that we're still making tons of money. So I, I guess that they yeah, that confirms my my suspicion there. Thanks for that. In this regard, yeah. I, I mean, um, you've had the, the I, I've known you since now. What like I think two years or something like that. And uh, I remember, years, Rob, yeah. yeah, Robin yeah. Bauman, our CMO. Uh, he connected us back in the days. And I want to give you quick props here as well at this point because we hopped on a call uh, with you 
We paid you a nice sum. You hopped on a call with us, and you just went on a quick rant. I think it was a 30- or 60-minute call where you kind of broke down your Instagram growth strategy with paid shout-outs. And, mm-hmm. and me and Robin, we're just, like, writing notes, like, the entire thing. We were, like, basically live transcribing what you said. And then we just implemented that. And now my chan- my, my Instagram account is almost 200,000 followers. It's about to crack 200,000 followers. Uh, we're making multiple six figures just from Instagram alone. So big, big shout out to you. Thank you. And just because we did that one fucking call with you. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that. And then uh, you also, um, I remembered, and after that, you know, I kind of looked at what you're doing and so on and so forth. And you really, really, really got fucked once by, I'm not going to go into detail because I'm not sure how much detail you are allowed to say, but you got really, yeah. really fucked by a very, very large company. Um, yeah. How much can you tell us about that, uh, if if you can at all? <laughs> well, I know this. I know this is going to get put onto the platform that fucked me, so we're not going to go directly talking about the <laughs> name. Um, yeah. Long story short, I, you know, early stages. I was one of the very early first ones to on Instagram, growing through shoutouts and building. Like it was shooting fish in a fucking barrel when I first started, hmm. um, and it blew up not only the agency but also blew up the other company that I built that uh, you know ended up essentially going sideways because of it. Um, they took me down. Ten month battle, David and Goliath style battle. If people can visualize what that would look like, they could put two and two together um and then they came i came back and after you know taking them on with lawsuits and legal and everything else um came back and i was completely the other way the account was cooked the account was completely cooked everything I had to go sideways um but you know just went back and built in foundations again right one of the things that we talk about all the time as well is like strength and foundations and building the foundation getting back to this standpoint like last two years i've put in you know, day in, day out with my team, making sure that we can get to the point, even watching, you know, people like you just come through and smash Instagram the way you have. is just phenomenal to see. I'm just like, fuck, I wish I didn't go down the first time around. Where would I be? But it's yeah. just like, it is what it is. So yeah, it was that, that story is that story is for more of an in-person conversation or a non-podcast yeah. recorded conversation. <laughs> for sure, man. Yeah, I still, I yeah. still appreciate you talking about it. Yeah. Um, to change, to, to, to change topics a little bit, how, how do you what's your hiring procedure like how do you hire the best fucking people that then run the marketing campaigns at such a high level we're doing a lot of hiring right now because we're expanding so much so i'd love to have your take on that as well um so i've learned that lesson very hard over the last two to three years as well um learned a lot of lessons over the last two to three years to be completely honest with you and the reason being is because you know the 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 company and the team that builds you to get from where you are, were to where you are is not the team and the company that's going to take you from where you are to where you want to mm. go. Um, through that entire process, the one thing that you've got to understand and realize is you've got to burn, essentially, you know, the reason you look at forest fires is a perfect analogy, right? Why do forest fires happen? Why do, The only way for pine cones to be burned is through a forest fire to a new forest so that new trees can grow, mm. right? Because it's, it's essentially an old um, analogy. The reason they happen is because the place that they are, they can't grow anymore. You can't get any more luscious forest because of it. The business that you want cannot go any more luscious with the team that you have. Now, if you consider having the team that brought you to where you are and you aren't willing, they aren't willing to step up into the roles that you need them to be and you need them to play in, you're never going to get there. The easiest way to do that is to find someone that's done it, built it had the experience in it that get them to come into your company. It may take you three to six months. It took me almost eight months to find this person, come into your company and then give them the keys and say, go. And you have to have full certain trust in that person that can turn your entire company around internally. Because if you're willing to do that, not only are you going to learn, your team's going to learn and you're going to have a process of self-selection because the ones that weren't going to stand by you anyways are going to leave within 30 to 90 days. Mm. So that one person that you got in, what kind of role did that person have? Was that COO or just so COO? Yeah, no, COO. We brought him on as a very high level COO. Um, and we tried to do this two or three times over over the last two years. And we just were like, oh, this person can do it. They've got some experience. Oh, this person can do it. They've got some experience. Both times we did it without until we got this person. They sold us fucking smoke and mirrors, essentially. And learned a lot through the whole process, obviously, who not to hire, learned that for sure, mm-hmm. uh, what to look for. And then we got very, very diligent, right? Even with um, the company that I was with that we're launching on the other side of the exit side, I sat down with him and I'm like, hey, how does private equity hire? I want to know their playbook, right? What is What do they go? Because obviously they're willing to go as deep and as, like, as dirty as they need to. And he broke down the entire playbook. And I'm like, I'm executing this. Obviously took out some 
bunch of bullshit that we don't need the private equity uses. Um, and I'm like, I'm executing this. And we went through three rounds of recruiting, almost hired one guy. Um, and then I'm like, on the last, like, you know, when they're both, the offer letter is about to go out, I'm just like, something doesn't feel right. I pulled the plug on it. I was like, nope, not doing this. Went again for another round and it took us literally almost eight or nine months uh, before we found the guy that we have today. And this guy has been in the industry for, you know, north of 20 years, um, has been part of three massive exits in, in the agency space, turned around multiple companies. I'm like, here you go. And I literally, when he, when I, when he came here and I'm like, here's the keys to the kingdom have at it. I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what to do. If there's anything that I can help you with, I'm going to be here. And, you know, we're almost 90 to 120 days into this relationship with him. And it's been so refreshing because not only, and not only has it been what he's done for the company, but I've learned personally so much just because I've removed my ego from it. And been like, Oh, I'm the founder. I own this other company. It's like, no, fuck off. Like you're just founder. You own the company, but someone can do this better than you can. Damn, damn. Um, I, I have two clarifying clarification questions in regards to this. Number one, what is your role in that when the COO basically takes off, takes takes up most of the operational stuff? And then number two, what is kind of the compensation structure? I mean, you don't have to tell the exact numbers, but what is kind of the compensation structure? We're talking about it when you get a guy like that in. Do they get a cut from the exit? Do they get a cut mm -hmm. from the from the recurring rev? Or how does it look like? Yeah, yeah. Um, salary, obviously. Yeah, they've got to pay their, their and a very, very decent one. Um, to the point where right now, I know on paper on salary, and I don't have a problem saying this because of zero ego around it, he makes more than I make as the owner and the founder of the company. Mm. Um, and that's the level of confidence you got to have, right? In the company. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And then number two is, yeah, a small piece of the exit for sure. There is that was part of the negotiation. And we put that up front because we knew if we we're going to attract someone at his level or at whatever level they needed to be, they need to be incentivized just outside of a salary and bonus structure. They need to be incentivized and they need to be part of the long term vision. That's really yeah. what it came down to. Um, and then my role to answer your first part of the question, my role now is transitioning very aggressively and in the sense of, you know, moving away as much from the day to day as possible, not going into the office as much doing more podcasts, which will be fun, probably in the next little bit, launching my own podcast at some point this year, which will be fun. Nice. Um, and just be focused 100% on growth. Like, that's all I want to do. Um, that's what I know how to do. That's what, you know, where I spent most of my days with my network and everything else. So, you know, I'm heading to Europe next month and or to UK next month to speak and get back on stages and doing all that stuff, doing doing the dancing bear thing. Mm -hmm. Um and just finding your role. So for some people, that not might that that might not be the role. For me, I enjoy it. I enjoy the networking. Um, that's how I built the company. So we can you know take it and put more of a fucking rocket fuel onto this. Thing. It's cool that you say this. Finding your own role. That that was also kind of like one thing that clicked for me the last year. I'm like every everybody has a primary, secondary, and tertiary skill. And my secondary and tertiary skills, I think, are are very much around sales and leading and inspiring a team. But my primary skill is just content creation like I, I love nothing more than sitting there for like three hours ranting to the camera and then next thing short form videos just writing content all the time like that makes me the happiest and i think also i'm the best at that and over the last yeah. couple of years i was so much in the operation so much in the weeds with scaling our sales team that i completely didn't do anything with content so my whole primary skill was just there but it was not really used was not utilized um, so it really clicked when you said like, oh, you love the networking part. And then you, you're going to go back to that now that you have the COO that kind of does the other stuff. Um, th that's just like another a confirmation of, of like the things that I've been dwelling on over the last couple of months. It's really cool. How, um, how important would you say is that at each stage of entrepreneurship to leverage their primary skill? Because for example, at your stage, it totally makes sense because you got the COO, he handles kind of the day to day biz. What about if, if someone's getting started from zero to 10K a month, from 10K to 100K a month? How are we talking about in terms of balancing what you're really good at versus what you just got to fucking grind out and do? You just gotta get, there's a phase that you just got to quit being a little bitch and just do shit. Like, like yeah. that's what I tell everybody, right? At the end of the day. Um, like, even when I first got started, I went, before I brought anybody on, I was at what, 30 or $40,000 a month um, in revenue before I ever brought anybody in i just did everything sales <laughs> fucking fulfillment running the ads dealing with customers like the whole nine yards really isn't that hard like if you actually think about it it's really not that hard um but the opposite side of it you've also got to look at it from a bigger picture is okay at some point you're going to get to a point where you're going to realize because you're going to end up in these peaks and valleys right eventually yeah 
because it's um where it's like you're gonna sell then you're gonna go fulfill then you're gonna go sell then you're gonna go fulfill but okay yeah. well outside of selling fulfillment what do you enjoy the most and if you enjoy fulfilling and being the guy that's behind the scenes and doing the work because you know you can drive the best results then do that but then be and still have a face by putting out content and written content but on the opposite side what i need what you probably should look at doing is having someone that thrives in the sales and then fill yeah. in that role, right? So fill the role that is going to be your complete counter part, uh, counter opposite to what you enjoy doing, and then build build through that entire thing. Cool. I mean, similarly to that, also uh, you're kind of known to like buy and merge agencies. How, what's your process there? What do you look for when you want to buy and merge an agency? What are, what are kind of red flags? And generally speaking, how do you get people to merge into your stuff? Yeah, so right now we're on a very aggressive path of rolling up companies. We're actually looking at rolling up our one of our biggest competitors, um, uh, as we speak, and then we're going to go for a bigger place. And we're going to try and buy someone bigger than us by the end of this year. Uh, so we're putting, you're putting, just putting a lot of those um, pieces in play. Fortunately, we have the team, um, and I have the partnership that can help. Uh, that, that has done this at a very, very big level, right? So it's like I've got an unfair playbook, and I'll be very honest on that. That's saying that um but it's not it's not as difficult as most people understand right um we did a very small one last year to test the waters and see okay what are the less learning lessons and now uh, let's go play big um the big thing is understanding okay what are you what are you buying for are you buying for talent or are you buying for uh client and those are the two usually the the two main reasons you buy for when you're buying an agency or buying any company for us right now, it's a multitude of things, right? We're looking for talent. We're looking for a client. We're looking for increase in our EBITDA because we know the quicker we can grow our EBITDA, the quicker we can get to our exit number within uh, a short period of time. Um, the plan we currently have, and I'll be very, very honest about this, the plan we currently have in place as of Monday of this week may have completely changed. And we're going to, uh, and next week, my entire board, my entire exec team is flying into town. We're going to restructure this entire thing because what we thought we were going to go for might end up becoming bigger just by accident. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just based on a call we had this Monday. So the way we're now looking at everything is okay. You know, we're not the biggest guys in the info space anymore by a stretch by any means, because we just don't really put the time and effort there. But we are a very decent sized brand that can take on a lot. Um, and this infrastructure. So, we're, okay, if that's the case, who can we go after? So now we're looking at anything that we can vertically integrate into, into the three or four different buckets info being one, direct to consumer, e commerce being the other, professional services, home service being the other, and then sporting um, is the four buckets that we're going after. And we're just looking for hey, do you want to continue running this thing yourself? You know, do the headache all day in, day out, try and compete against, you know, us, you, all the other agencies, or do you want to come under the umbrella and we can feed you a consistent amount of business? Because we've got a pretty decent marketing engine out there now that's, you know, for lead flow and everything else that you'll never be able to touch us within the next six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. And you can just be the founder in your own little bucket that's under the entire brand. Uh, that's the way we're running into and doing it by just having blatant conversations and painting a vision that can be bigger than most people can't vision and will see is how we're buying the agencies. <laughs> Sick. I mean, are there any red flags that you're looking out for? Oh yeah. The red flags come through during due diligence. So man, like you, like, you know, the, the thing is like, it goes back to the, what I said earlier with the offers and especially in our, in the agency space too, it's like, a lot of agencies play like they're bigger than they are. Like I was blatantly honest and said earlier, it's like we're not the biggest guys in the info space by means anymore. We were, we're not. Um, and I and most people are so attached to the ego of holding that, where it's like mm -hmm. I can give two flying fucks, keep, keep it. Like you want the badge, have it. I'm like my vision is so different that I don't need to be the biggest guy in anything. I just want to have my own vision and run to that. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest red flags is when they say they're the best at one thing. Well, you're not the best at that one thing because I guarantee I'll probably find someone that's probably just as good, if not better than you. And then on the opposite side of it, my question, my answer to them is going to be, okay, well, when, so let's get into due diligence. This is you know, give me a number that you that you think you're worth or you want to be valued at. We'll have a look at it. We'll look at your due diligence, and then we'll get into the books. We'll get into the operations, and we'll see it's a complete fucking shit show. And then we'll probably not do the deal just because of, just because of that. I mean, when you say you look at the books and the operations, what do you look for? Do you look at how much structure is there versus how much freestyle? Um, do you look at the KPIs if they have any? If so, how they stick? Yeah, it's to like them at the end of the day, the books have got to be the tightest, right? Especially during and especially for us when we're because 
let me put it this way. When we look at buying a company, and especially the way we're buying them right now, okay, if we buy the company, call it between three and five million bucks, right? We're paying for a company. At three and five million dollars, we need to within 24 to 36 months, that three to five million dollars needs to, on the low end, pay us between eight and nine million dollars. Right. So it's like they have to have something there that we can double within yeah. just by adding just by adding it on. Um, that doesn't include all of the risk that we're taking on for, you know, shit could hit the phantom or everything else. But like just based on the baseline numbers, we need to be able to double that amount um, in the next 24 to 36 months. Now, that being said, on the opposite side of that, when we get through that other the other part of it is, OK, how, how well are like where are they spending their money? What are they doing with it? Are they going out and blowing it every single weekend? Are they just taking and investing it into the team? Are they investing it into assets? Is there an investment strategy through it? There's multiple different things that you can look at. Are they just living it off of a lifestyle business? Because if it's a lifestyle business, it's worth nothing to me. Like at all, it's not worth anything to me. Because then I'm just buying people. And then at that point, if people already know that you're trying to sell, as soon as I say I'm not doing the deal, they're going to come knocking on their door anyways. Um, so there's, there's, there's a few different ways of going through that entire process of understanding it. Um, when even, you know, one of the things that we do, and when we talk about it too, is understanding how to, you know, scaling up, professionalizing it and being also profiting up, getting clear for the exit really is going to be that part. And this, and what we're actually teaching, I'm actually literally going to be teaching this in two weeks in LA with my partner on skill to sale is the scaling up and, and understanding the profits because there's people there's, and then there's also profit and understanding how can you integrate the people part of that business that's probably sometimes to me worth more than even the business itself because if mm -hmm. i can get the right team member from another company they can see the vision i know they'll bend over backwards because i'm just giving them a second opportunity more mm -hmm. letting them go because i could yeah yeah mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah, it does. I mean, but when you say like you want to you want to buy a company for the people, why don't you just hire them, hire the person without having to buy the company? Um, There's multiple facts on that part. Like I said, like if we don't do a deal, for example, and like we go through due diligence, we talk to the people because we interview a lot of the guys in the team and hey, this is what we want to do. If we don't do the deal in the end, mostly like the people in that team be like, what happened to the buyout? I thought there was a buyout. What do you think is going to end up happening? Ooh. Right. my LinkedIn, my LinkedIn reaches out, my email comes into play. And then obviously now it's like, if we had a good relationship with them, the, the people may totally not realize what's actually going on inside the company. Um, we also look at, you know, and, and then even with, even with contracts and customers, um, you know, sometimes we'll do due diligence with customers and be like, Hey, what's been your experience working with these guys? And we'll be blatant. Like, you know, we're looking at potentially purchase, purchasing these guys. Um, so it's like soon you'll be working with us if this deal goes through. So, there's there's that whole world too it's you know um and then even with the people and the business itself there's two parts that i or two things that i want to see you know, are the people predictable are they repeatable are they doing their job exactly the way they need to be doing it? and are they scalable um and so the operations need to be the exact same way so there's that whole thing that comes from it quick interlude this episode is sponsored by nobody by you, the viewer. Thanks for viewing. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate that. Uh, I'm probably not going to have anything sponsored anytime soon unless I find something. So the only thing I really ask you here is to number one, give us a five star rating, whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, there's probably a thumbs up or a five star rating thingy. Please go ahead and do that. It really helps us reach more people, get more awesome people on the podcast here as well. And also the second thing I'm asking you for is to share this episode or any other episode that you find useful. Share it with a friend, your mom, someone on the internet. If you profit from this, if you learn at least one new thing, share it with someone. Share the good vibes, share the knowledge. Let's all be a part of an awesome upward spiral of success here. And as the mosquitoes are biting me, uh, let's crack right back into the episode. When you're when you're hiring a players, what out of your experience? Because I'm I'm sure your company is full of them. Uh, what uh, out of your experience? What are kind of like the driving factors that makes a players want to work with you as opposed to others? Apart from the obvious ones, such as better pay, more money. Yeah, no. When I'm hiring a player, like even when I hire a CEO, right? One of the first things that I'm uh, one of the first things that I have, and you know, across the board with any of my executive team, <coughs> I have one rule: is that you can't have an ego. Like you cannot have an ego. And the reason being is an ego will fucking kill you. And I learned that the hard way. And coming from someone that went through that and learned that, don't have no problem owning it specifically in that world. 
is if you have an ego, you're not going to last. And the reason being is because I'm not going to enjoy working with you, right? If you fuck up, own it. If we win, we're going to own it. If we made a mistake, if it's it's across the board, I don't care what it comes down to. If we make a mistake with a client, with a team, we just want to be, be across that board. So I when hiring a player is the one thing that, you know, that I like, even when I said to Sean to go back to the story, is when I said to him, I said, hey, I want to bring you on board, but you know, I'm not here to bring you on board. Yes, I'm bring here to bring you on board for a role, but I'm here to bring you on board so that I can learn from you. Mm-hmm. Right? I will be a fucking sponge. You've been doing this for 20 years. I've been doing this for eight. Um, or less than eight, really, if you think about it. But it's like I've been doing this for like not even like for a short period of time. And even in the 90 days or so that he's been here, I've learned so much more from him than I ever thought. So it's like the pay is just a an amount. Let's get the company is going to subsidize. Like, what are you going to learn from them, and what are they going to learn from you? Hmm. So, if there's a fair exchange and relationship there, you're going to have a bigger outcome from it. Damn, man, that's a good point. When when you look at your company, w- what I'm trying to do with my company at this stage is, I, I kind of feel like you, I kind of feel like my company's always grown, and then it kind of had to be cleansed by the non-A players. And then mm-hmm. you grow again. So it's like you hire 10 new people, then whatever, three of them end up being A players, seven get cleansed, and you hire 10 more and so on and so forth. So I feel like this, for me, it's been kind of like this cycle all the time. And what I'm, what I'm really wondering is for companies of your size, how many of the people in there are A players? Are they all A players? Or do you have like kind of less important positions where you're like, whatever, this is fine, it's good enough? Yeah, no, we're going through a full cleanse right now. Full, full <laughs> okay. cleanse. Over the last probably four or five months, we've been going through a massive cleanse. Um, you got to go through that, man. Like you're gonna go through that completely. So, like even we had a we had a meeting yesterday. So we just hired a new head of a department that came in that's flown into town to kind of be here with the team of the week. Um, and you know we're restructuring that entire department. And the reason we're doing it is because the person that we hired for that a year and a half ago didn't once again smoke and mirrors came in played this game. Knew what he was talking about, but didn't perform at the level that we wanted him to. Um, and then we had to replace him, go through a bunch of stuff. And ev- the one thing about hiring that I can tell you is if you don't hire right the first time around, it fucking sucks. Not only in the sack, not only in the fact of, oh man, I fucked up and hired the wrong person, but it can put you back, you know, not only the time that you spent hiring them, but the time that you spent integrating them into the company. Yeah. yeah. Now you gotta double that. Yeah. Right. Not only do you have to double that, now your team questions you because they're like, mm. oh, does this guy even know what he's doing? So you have to build all of that trust again. So there's yeah. multiple facets when it comes to hiring. And and when I say we've learned that the hard way, so no, we don't have eight players across the board. You need the machine. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that at the end of the day, because there's some people that just love that, and there's some people that don't. And even through a cleanse, like right now, there's one department just got cleansed. We're getting ready to cleanse another entire department. It's probably going to take us about 60 days to get through that. And then we'll be, you know, in a place to, again, push as hard as we can, get it to a level, probably cleanse again, then gun again, and Mm -hmm. cleanse again. So it's just the same repeatable cycle. Good to know. Good to know that that, that's normal, (laughs) the cleansing. Uh, All right. Um, To kind of completely change the topic here, I'm not sure if you're allowed to answer that, but just by looking at what you've been doing on social media, could it be that you closed a Formula One deal in whatever extent somehow Uh, that you're involved in there? (laughs) It's not done yet. It's getting there. (laughs) Okay. It's getting there. Let's put it that. It's not done yet. It's getting there. Oh, man. Uh, Very close. That is close. epic. I mean, it, yeah. let me know. Let me know when when you're allowed to talk you're about that. For I sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we gotta go. We gotta go to a Formula One race together this year. Dude, I'm down. I'm down. Uh, I always go yeah. to one in Austria. Of course, it's only like an hour away yeah. from me, and it's and it's fucking great. I've se- I've seen you being at, at multiple. So yeah, we're hyped for. I'll probably, uh, be, at, I'll probably be at Spa this year. Ooh. Um. Yeah. So because we'll be it's at not Tomorrowland. Too far away. Yeah, we'll be at Tomorrowland, and then the next day after that is Spa. So I'm like, fuck, what are you there? Let's go. <laughs> So yeah, we'll keep it close. Yeah, up. that is one hell of a combination, man. That is one yeah. hell of a combination. Um, a, a whole other question is: so, as far as I understood, is like you've done three years of courses for the pilot's license in one mm-hmm. year, and you did all that while running, building companies and whatnot. Like, what's the, what's the damn secret behind that? Because I've started pilot's license in 2020 before COVID hit, 
and it was tough as hell. And then I just kind of put it on ice because, you know, COVID I had to hustle through to make the company survive. Um, yeah. But yeah, I would love to hear your secret behind that. Well, I already, so my original dream as a kid was to, and you know, this painting that I got done was before, was when my dad passed away and part of it being Mickey's wearing pilot glasses. Oh, right? These, all right. Right. So it's kind of what it is. Cause we came from a world of, uh, coming from the travel industry, right? We had a very large travel company and traveled all over the world till I was pretty much 11 years old before we moved to Canada. And um, I always wanted to travel. And the dream for me was to be a pilot. I remember my mom says this to me all the time. Like, since I couldn't know what a job was, I would say I wanted to be a pilot. Nice. So when I got out of school and I, you know, finished school, I was actually dropped out, really. Um, I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to go and do the pilot's course. And then it happened to be like around this time where it's like beautiful weather in Vancouver and all that stuff. And I was like, fuck it, let's go. And I just went as hard as I can. I remember being in school 12, 14, 15 hours a day, um, studying, doing whatever the fuck I needed to do and just like trying to push as hard as I can. And then got to the end of it. And then they're like, oh yeah, we have a job offer. This company has a job offer for you. And I was like, cool, this is sick. So then I took a look at the offer and I'm like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. And, and it was just the most retarded number I'd ever seen where just like, I was like, there's no way I was making more money at McDonald's working during <laughs> high school than this job offer. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm not doing this. Um, I love flying. I'm actually going back. I went yesterday, funny enough to go, cause I got to get eye surgery before I can go back flying again. Oh, um, cause it fucked my eye up a couple of years ago. Um, but I'm going to go back to start flying soon. I love, I love it. It just spent like even tra getting to travel as much as they do for me. It's like the one place where it's just like, I feel just, a calm like no one if i don't want to no one can get a hold of me as long as i don't buy wi-fi right like it's just a place where i can think and mm -hmm. you're flying you can see completely this unobstructed views and just makes you think so differently um so there's that part of it but yeah so and then one of the things that i like to do anything that i do is like when i start to study something i go obsessive like very fucking mm -hmm. obsessive um and that came from pilots that comes from marketing that comes from personal development it's like I will spend hours, any minute that I can think of, that I can spend learning, I will spend learning that thing. But it's like that's just like an obsessive switch of mine. And that's the reason why I was able to take a three year course and do it in a year and a year and a half, essentially, it's like in half the time. Damn. I hear this so many times, this 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 idea about obsession. And, and I always thought I'm something is wrong with me because I was always super obsessed with at first it was guitar, heavy metal. And then it was video games and all that jazz. And it's like a recurring theme. And everybody that has crushed it that I've talked to, they're always like, yeah, I get obsessed really easily. So it's cool to hear that it was kind of the same for you. Now, you also mentioned that, you know, you come from a from a family uh, where entrepreneurship is very much in your DNA, almost like that. And this is a question I ask everyone. How much of entrepreneurship do you think is nurture versus nature? I think it's a balance. Um, I think it's a balance of 50-50 because you have to have it and i think everybody has it inside of them they just don't take the time to see it and that's okay because and the reason why i say it's okay is because entrepreneurship is not for everybody like you have to be almost psychotic to a certain level yeah and and, and psychotic at a level um to get like even if you've if you've read elon musk's new book like it fucking speaks for itself right like the guy is just a unit when it comes to entrepreneurship and he's a definition of what it takes to be a true entrepreneur if you look at it you know he's done some very questionable things to his process but still like to get to what he's built at one time wow um even looking at it from like so i come from an entrepreneur family um across the board but i would say my parents weren't very entrepreneurial um and the reason being is my dad and my bro and his brother started a company that was very very large um my uncle had the risk profile of an entrepreneur well my dad had the risk profile of just being the nurturer inside of the company so they balanced you know they mm -hmm. balanced the dynamics there mm -hmm. um when we moved to canada my dad tried to do that and do it on his own but he didn't have the entrepreneur bone to go out there and get it done he did well enough to get it to, to get it you know stable um, yeah. but nothing to the levels of what they built in in India. Like with the largest travel agency at an airline at one point, like it was like it was wild. But um, and you know, it's funny looking back at it, you look at it today. Me and my brother run Grow Rev mainly together. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm the one that's just full blown high risk profile on one mm -hmm. side, whereas like he's you know, he's got that safety guard, safety net inside of him. 
So it's like in an entrepreneur, in it comes from nature and nurture, it's got to be a balance of both. And there's certain roles where he's got a high risk profile that I don't. And I play the opposite side of it. And mm -hmm. in every, you know, the one thing that I've learned from one of my close mentors, Dr. John Martini, is like everybody has a trait in them. It's how much are you willing to pull that trait out and go as hard as you want. Damn. Um, one thing I noticed a lot with with you when I'm when I'm following you is like you also do you're also family man. You go real hard on one hand with entrepreneurship, but on the other hand, you also have uh your own family um one thing that i'm kind of scared of at this part of my life i'm 33 now I'm turning 34 soon and i really want kids but at the same time i'm like i kind of have the fear that because i'm still also want to go all in with the biz and just keep crushing for the next couple of years mm -hmm. i have a fear that that takes away from me being a good father and or vice versa so i'd love to know how you're balancing that because i see you already know how to one hundred percent dude it's so like we've got a newborn right now and um even like being on this call it's just like you can hear him screaming over there uh but it's just like at the end of the day you just kind of have to figure it out um i'll tell you right now man it's the most what's the one i'm looking for on one end is the most rewarding thing you do on the opposite end you also look at your life and you're like why did i do this to myself and in the in, in the exact same lens right it's kind of crazy and the reason being is because you come from the world of building businesses and building stuff and it's just like, the, the mentality that you got to have and i look at it in a way where if you're going to just not if at some point you're going to do it right you're going to do it now it's, and you got to choose your heart and the way i look at it is like, okay if i choose my heart now is it going to be fun and easy later on and or is it going to be fun or harder later on now the hardest part and then someone said this to me and it, and it fucking smoked me right between my head about you know six or eight months ago and they said, is it interesting that as men or across the board, the ones that want to build fam build businesses and build families at the exact same time, the phase in your life that you want to build a business and build a legacy is the exact same phase that you have to choose, or most people choose to build a family. Two of the mm. hardest fucking things at one time. Ah, <laughs> shit. Right? And if you look at that, it's like usually your mid-30s, kind of both, you know, I'll be 35 in, in literally a month. Uh, and you're going to be 34 soon, so we're only a year apart. And uh, when he said that to me, and this guy is about to sell his company for $120 million in about two to three weeks coming up here. And I just saw him last week in Florida. And when he said that to me, and I'm like, God damn, he couldn't be speaking the fucking truth. And he went through it, right? He went through the exact same thing. He's a little bit older than us. But he's like, it was the hardest mm. four to five years of his life earlier on. Because it's like, you feel like you're missing out. But then what are you missing out from, right? Because it's like, then you're building this thing to give them everything and build the family. But now when he exits and in, in, in about, you know, in a few weeks from now and signs the paperwork, he can be there and do whatever the fuck he wants. Mm. So, I mean, in this regard, what kept you from why didn't you just wait and say, well, let's wait two, three, four more years till I got that ex exit in the bank? Well, and I also look at it from that future pace myself, right? When I'm like, okay, well, if, you know, when they're 18, 19, 20, 21, and wanting to have the fun part of yours in their life, it's like, how old am I going to be? Mm, fun. Right? Like, yeah. Like, that's the one that got my head going. And I'm just like, okay. Well, I didn't have the fortunate thing. Like, my dad passed away when, you know, he passed away four years ago now um and you know it throughout the last years and even when i was younger so we didn't have that relationship so it's like having that opportunity to be able to give them the stuff the lifestyle and be able to go out and hey you know let's go and fucking smash some beers and have some fun like i want to be able to still do that take up golfing do all the fun stuff that i enjoy doing even my daughter too it's like having having those outcomes um if i did it later on who knows would i be around like who knows like obviously mm. there's so many like with technology is changing so fast but it's like that was also kind of in the back of my head like okay well i don't want to be too old and have kids because then there's also a point where it's like i have a really close friend in our industry and i was having this conversation with him in new york last month and i'm like what happened like you were you know down this path of marrying getting engaged all the stuff and kind of called quits and you want a kids, and I really have to say you want kids, and he's just like, well, you get to a point where you get too old, and you realize like, what's the fucking point? Mm -hmm. And I go, 
And then now you're like, and then you said, then you start watching it from their eyes and you're like, okay, well, you know, you start to be in your like early forties and you're like, fuck, I should have just had kids earlier on. Mm. And then you start, and you just turn into an absolute fucking degenerate. And you're like, mm. maybe, maybe that's a different, even though, even though it looks easier, but it's an easy, because it's just a bandy that he's putting on the outside to make it look easier. Mm, damn. Damn. Uh, I know you got to go in a bit, but how do you define a supportive family? Is it, is it kind of like your family's just kind of letting you do your thing or are they more involved? I mean, apart from your brother who's involved and more talking about your, your spouse and your kids. Um, that's a very loaded question. And the reason <laughs> why I say it's a very loaded question is because, you know, you've got to have a balance of, if one person's focus on family, the other person has to be fully focused on legacy. Um, and especially our work, right? Like whichever way you want to call it. Because, you know, the work-life balance cliche, in my personal opinion, actually doesn't exist. Because, you know, and, you know, when I'm working, I'm fucking working. Like I was in, you know, people like look at my travel schedule sometimes. They're like, how the fuck do you do it? And like, you just have to do it. Like you don't have a choice, right? um flying retarded hours speaking doing networking sleeping two to three hours a night four hours a night maximum for three days coming back and then bam you're right back into this right like you don't have an off switch so that's where the work-life balance just doesn't exist and the way i look at it is you have to have it in a balanced perspective of if both of you are sacrificing something which one are you choosing mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah, one is sacrificing then... on the work side to go as hard as they possibly can to give it everything they've got to go. The other person has to be willing to sacrifice in the family. Yeah, and if you don't have that in balance, even though it's not balanced, really, but if you don't have that in balance, you're not going to be able to make it work. Because if you if you're going to try and put fifty fifty here and they're going to try and put fifty fifty here, you're not fucking putting a hundred percent in anything. Yeah, and now you're fucked. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. I mean, you mentioned your daughter. She comes up to you in whatever, 10, 15, 20 years, and she says, Hey, dad, I want to be an entrepreneur. What do you do? What do you tell her? Go do it. Um, that's gonna be that's gonna be really what it's gonna be. Obviously, my you know, one thing is gonna be she's gonna have access, like even if I just turn this camera around, like the amount of books that I have <laughs> were just in just in this room, not counting in the room behind me or my office that's 20 minutes from where I am. It's just gonna be like you know, you really want to be an entrepreneur? Like, grab every one of these fucking books and read them over the next twelve over the next twelve months. Um, you know, get this right before you go get before you start figuring that out. But I'm not gonna tell them not to do it. And the reason being is, it teaches you to be a stronger fucking human being. And anything can come at you. Like we talked about the story of me getting fucked or like a few years ago by one of the biggest companies. Dude, I remember the day I got that. I thought my life was going to be done, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you just literally look at yourself in the mirror and go, how am I going to get out of this? But you do somehow, some way, eventually you figure it out and you get out of it. And once you come out the other side of it, you're like, if I can survive this, I can survive anything. And then now there's a new level of challenge, right? And then the way you look at it is, it, like, that whole, like, if if this was my, my base before, going through that battle made my base even higher. Right. So, so your foundation now is here. Now going through the next level of challenge, it continue pushes you. So if someone's struggling down here, you just look at their problem and be like, Oh, I could fix that in two seconds. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Like just the way the way you look at it. Um, and the reason being is that's the one thing about entrepreneurship that I could tell everybody is like if you are willing to put yourself through that amount of stress and come out the other side and not have to phase you, you're built for it. Bam. I would say these are beautiful uh wrap up words here, my man. Um Last but not least, how can people contact you? How can people find you? Um, Instagram, website, and so on and so forth. Yeah, Instagram. Um, I know my personal website, I think it's still down, but rebuilding it, it could be down. But anyway, Instagram is probably the easiest. I'm the most active on Instagram, to be honest, right now. It's nope. just Rohan underscore chef. That's my kind of play that I, just the social that I play on. I know everybody and their dogs have been asking me to play on Twitter, and I'm just like, eventually, eventually, when I get some time, I will play on Twitter. You got to um, reactivate that, uh, that 2013 account, man. I will. I love to go back and bring that back to life. 
Um, uh, yeah. And then kind of, you know, one of the ones I'm, I'm taking on soon here is going to be LinkedIn talking, mm-hmm. just kind of sharing some of the stuff more in depth and strategies and everything else. That's going to be one that'll be coming through, sure. um, over the next little bit. And, you know, um, on that, just reach out DM and looking forward to potentially doing part two of this at some point. I know we wanted to do a longer one. It's just hard for me to right now commit to yeah. two hour long chats <laughs> around this stuff because, and they, they could get deep if we went two hours. I'll tell you I that know. right now. I know. I'm looking forward to that, man. We'll we'll catch up on that. Well, thanks so much. Well, I'll, for... be, I'll be in the UK. I'll be in the UK more than likely next month. Uh, if you're around, I'm coming to speak at an event there. Well, it's in, only a me. two, three hour flight. So depending on, uh, yeah, I'll be in Finland. So it's literally just a two, three hour flight. So I can definitely make it happen, actually. Let's sort it out. Maybe we'll do an in-person part two. Yeah, in, in... I'm down. Let's do it, Let's man. Do it. Well, so. thanks all for your time. I'm going to let you go now. And uh, yeah, go crush. Go. I mean, I know you will. So <laughs> yeah. just enjoy the ride, man. Awesome, man. It was cool watching the sun, the sunset behind you too, doing this entire thing. Yeah, yeah it was, that was pretty, pretty epic, sick. man. Pretty yeah. epic, man. Yeah. All right. Man, stay in touch. Take care. Cheers, man. Yeah, we'll do Bye. And we're back. If you get inspired by Rohan's absolutely incredible mindset, growth, and all that jazz, and you're saying, hey, I want to scale my existing business, or you say, hey, this whole business thing sounds awesome. I want to start my own business. We can help you with that. Simply go to maxtorno.com forward slash call. Book your free consultation there directly with me and my team. If you want to get into digital consulting, coaching, or online service providing, this is for you, maxtorno.com forward slash call. You just fill out the application, and then you can book your exact date and time where you want to hop on a call with us. So let's make it happen. Thank you so much for watching, for listening, and all that jazz. I appreciate the hell out of you. Thank you, and talk soon.